The swap chain is a series of frame buffers used to display images to our window. In previous videos, I've said how our graphics pipeline outputs to a target frame buffer, and how a frame buffer can have different attachments, such as color buffers or a depth buffer. Now the swap chain also uses these frame buffer objects, but to read from the color attachment to then display to our window surface. Any modern operating system will typically use at least two buffers at once. This is known as double buffering. The frame buffer being displayed is known as the front buffer, and the buffer being rendered to is designated the back buffer. The swap chain handles coordinating with the display to swap the front and back buffers at the appropriate time just prior to the vertical sync. Vertical sync, or vSync, is the moment at which the display begins drawing the new image and is tied to our display's refresh rate. So for example, if your display's refresh rate is 60 Hz, that means 60 times per second or every 16.6 milliseconds, the vSync occurs and our front and back buffers are swapped. It's possible to ignore the synchronization. In many games, this is done by disabling vSync in the graphical settings, in which case you may observe tearing. Tearing is when our display shows information from multiple frames in a single screen draw. Note that not only do we have multiple frame buffers, but each frame buffer also requires unique attachments. This isn't always true. Depending on our usage, we can get away with sharing certain attachments like the depth buffer some of the time, since usually we're only displaying the color buffer. This seems like a pretty great solution, but there's a possible drawback. Once we finish rendering the frame, our device needs to wait until the next vSync and frame buffer swap before starting to work on the subsequent frame. If we had a second back buffer, we could start working on the next frame immediately. This is known as triple buffering. The main downside is that extra memory is required for storing the additional image. The main upside occurs in cases where rendering a frame can't keep up with the refresh rate of the display. With double buffering, even if a frame just misses the vSync, our graphics device has to wait all the way until the next vSync before it can start working again. To a user, this can seem like a noticeable hiccup where the frame rate has suddenly dropped. Triple buffering avoids this problem by always providing a frame buffer to work on. If you've worked with OpenGL or other graphics APIs before, triple buffering is probably not something you've had to deal with. It's usually handled automatically behind the scenes, but like with most things in Vulkan, we need to be explicit about it. Of course, all of this is a bit of a simplification, and there are exceptions to this. You may have heard of Adaptive Sync or G-Sync, which changes the display's behavior so it doesn't have to wait the entire update period before refreshing. Also, all of this depends on the type of present mode our swap chain is using. We'll discuss this more in a bit, but for now the key takeaways are 1. We will have multiple frame buffers, likely 2 or 3. And 2. Each frame we ask the swap chain to tell us which frame buffer our graphics pipeline should be using. So, for the same reasons as for the device class, this is the one other instance where I'll be providing a chunk of code for you to download, and that we will come back to as we start to cover more advanced topics, such as images for textures and off-screen frame buffers for rendering reflections and shadows. This swap chain class handles the synchronization and setup for double or triple buffering based on your device's capabilities. It also creates frame buffer objects and their associated color and depth attachments for our graphics pipeline to use while rendering. In the description below, there's a download link for the swap chain code. Let's download it and then drag the files into your project. Then I'm going to do a find and replace and replace all the occurrences of my engine with LVE. And finally, just like with our device class, rename the header file as well as the implementation file. You will also need to update the include at the top of the swap chain implementation file to reflect the new file's name change. Now navigate to your window header file and add a getter that's going to return a VK extent 2D called get extent and return our width and height. So if you check out the type here, an extent is just a struct of an unsigned width and height. So really, we should explicitly cast these int values. So add a static cast uint32 type around width as well as around the height. Unfortunately, last week I made a mistake. 
If you open your pipeline header file, you may be able to see the problem with the pipeline config info struct. So let's fix this quickly. Start by deleting the VK pipeline viewport state create info, then open your pipeline implementation file. In our default pipeline config info function, the problem becomes more obvious. I had made it so that the viewport info has members that point to our viewport and scissor, which are stored in the same struct. This is typically something you want to avoid doing. If we create a copy of our pipeline config info, the pViewports and pScissor fields will point to the previous struct viewport and scissor, which may then be deallocated. Definitely not what I intended in this case. Now, depending on your compiler, you may or not have run into this because some compilers will optimize away the copy of this return in a process known as copy elision. So copy and remove these five lines and then paste them above our pipeline create info in the create graphics pipeline function. Create a new local variable VK pipeline viewport state create info called viewport info. And don't forget these two braces at the end. These braces have the effect of value initializing all of the struct members. So in this case, we are relying on the braces to set P next to be a null pointer and flags to equal zero. Remove the config info qualifier before each line and update the P viewport state to point to the local viewport info variable we just created. In our swap chain class, we have a function called choose swap present mode. Depending on your graphics device, I've set things up to choose the mailbox present mode by default and then vsync as the fallback. The present mode configures how our swap chain handles synchronization with our display. We can check the Vulkan documentation to see a description of the possible present modes. The only present mode guaranteed to be supported is FIFO. Otherwise, for all other present modes, you need to check that the available present modes vector contains your choice before returning it. So the FIFO present mode is what I discussed at the start of this video. This is where the swap chain synchronizes with the vSync of our display to prevent tearing. So what's the difference between FIFO and Mailbox? Well, when using FIFO, if our GPU can process images really fast, even if we're triple buffering, both our back buffers can be written to, and then our GPU will idle until the next refresh cycle where our swap chain swaps the images. But when using the Mailbox present mode, the GPU never idles and instead will discard and overwrite the older back buffer. When the display is ready to refresh, the swap chain will take whichever back buffer is completed with the most recent image. The advantage of this is that the frame presented to your display is fresher in terms of it will be updated with the latest user input, so input latency can be lower versus when using FIFO. However, because our GPU never idles, unless our application provides some additional manner of throttling, this can result in very high power consumption. So this is something you typically not want to use for mobile devices. So if you'd prefer to always use vSync, then you can comment out these lines like I have already done just below. The immediate present mode does not perform any synchronization with the refresh cycle of the display when updating the current image. This may result in visible tearing as well as a high CPU and GPU usage. I usually only use this when I want to get an indication of performance and maximum FPS since my device does not support the mailbox present mode. Now in our first app header, let's include our swap chain and then below our device, we create a new LVE swap chain variable, LVE swap chain, with our device as the first parameter and our window.getExtent as the second. Don't forget that order here matters and that variables are initialized from top to bottom and then destroyed in the reverse order. So if you build and run your code, in your console you should find an additional message saying what the selected present mode is just before the failed assertion we added in the previous video when initializing our pipeline. Okay, back to coding. In the first app header, add an include for memory, and now we're going to make the pipeline object be a unique pointer instead. So let's get rid of our old pipeline variable and declare a new std unique angle brackets LVE pipeline and I'll name it LVE pipeline. Also, this is a smart pointer. If you're unfamiliar with these, I strongly recommend doing a bit of reading on this topic. 
Learn CPP is a resource I really like and I've included some links in the description below. But as a quick refresher, a smart pointer simulates a pointer with the addition of automatic memory management so we're no longer responsible for calling new and delete. Next, add a private VK pipeline layout member variable named pipeline layout. And then underneath, add a vector of VK command buffer objects. So STD vector, VK command buffer, closing angle bracket, command buffers. And also don't forget to add include vector in our list of includes at the top of the file. We'll cover what our pipeline layout and command buffers are in just a moment. But before we do so, let's add some private functions. First, we have void create pipeline layout. Then void create pipeline. And finally, void create command buffers. While we're at it, we might as well add a void draw frame function here as well. Next, add a declaration for a constructor and destructor for first app. And finally, because our app is now managing Vulkan objects for our pipeline layout and command buffers, we should delete our copy constructors. I always forget how these go, so I'm just going to copy them from window and paste them in, and then update window to first app. Let's start with implementing our create pipeline layout function. Grab the function signature and paste it in. Add your class name scope and then create a VK pipeline layout create info variable called pipeline layout info. Just like we did in the previous video, we need to set the members of this struct. So first set S type to VK structure type pipeline layout create info. For now, we just want to create an empty layout. So let's set the set layout count member to equal zero and P set layouts to equal a null pointer. A pipeline set layout is used to pass data other than our vertex data to our vertex and fragment shaders. This can include textures and uniform buffer objects, which will all be covered soon. Next, set push constant range count to zero and p push constant ranges to a null pointer. Push constants are a way to very efficiently send a small amount of data to our shader programs, and I think we will get to them in about tutorial eight or so. Then in an if statement call VK create pipeline layout with our device dot device, a pointer to our pipeline layout info, a null pointer for our allocation callback, and then a pointer to our pipeline layout member variable. Check that this is not equal to VK success. And in such a case, throw a runtime error failed to create pipeline layout. At the start of the first app implementation, also add an include for std except. Next, let's implement the create pipeline function. Grab the function signature from the header file and paste it in. Then add the first app class name scope. We're going to start by creating a pipeline config. So auto pipeline config equals LVE pipeline default pipeline config info. And using our swap chain, get the width and height it's important to use the swap chains width and height as it doesn't necessarily match the windows. On high pixel density displays, such as Apple's Retina displays, the window measured in screen coordinates is smaller than the number of pixels the window contains. And we will set the render pass member of config info to our LVE swap chain dot get render pass. So I lumped creating a default render pass in with the swap chain code. This is something we will eventually pull out after we cover render passes in more detail. For now, all that is really necessary to know is that a render pass describes the structure and format of our frame buffer objects and their attachments. For example, in this basic setup, in attachment location zero, we will have a color buffer and in location one will be a depth buffer. So it may help to think of a render pass as a blueprint that tells a graphics pipeline object what layout to expect for the output frame buffer. That way, when it's time to actually render, our graphics pipeline is already prepared to output to a frame buffer, as long as the passed in frame buffer object is set up in a way that is compatible with what we specified in the render pass. For more complicated render passes, for example, a sequence of post-processing effects, 
multiple subpasses can be grouped together into a single render pass. Set the pipeline layout member of the config info to the pipeline layout member variable. So let's finish creating our pipeline by setting the pipeline member variable equal to std make unique LVE pipeline. Then for the first argument, LVE device, next the vertex path at shaders slash simple underscore shader dot vert dot SPV, and then the fragment shader, shaders slash simple underscore shader dot frag dot SPV, and finally the pipeline config. In our constructor, let's add calls to first create pipeline layout, then create pipeline, and then create command buffers. In the destructor, make sure to destroy the pipeline layout with vk destroy pipeline layout, device dot device, pipeline layout, and null pointer. If we add an empty implementation for the create command buffers and draw frame function, then our code should now compile. And since we've now provided a pipeline layout and a render pass to our pipeline config, our assertions that previously failed should now pass and creating our graphics pipeline will be successful. So let's build and run our code. And you should now have an empty window again and in your console, the previous assertion messages should now have disappeared.